On this episode of Popscast Appalachian Music, the Appalachian String Band Festival and its possible fate due to arts funding cuts, also live performances from Robin Kirton and Tom Foe. Popscast is made possible by the Urbana Pops Orchestra and the Community Center for the Arts in Urbana, Illinois. Engaging in community arts discussions and issues in Illinois and around the world, this is Popscast. <laughs> Hello, I'm Daniel Sutherland, Principal Conductor of the Urbana Pops Orchestra. Welcome to another episode of Popscast. Today we're going to be talking about the rich culture of traditional Appalachian folk music and its connection to public funding for the arts, specifically in the case of the Appalachian String Band Festival, more popularly known as Clifftop. We have a pair of Clifftop veterans here to talk about this wonderful festival and what it stands to be lost if public funding and uh, the festival relies on isn't restored. Uh, I have here Robin Kirton, who is the director of the Community Center for the Arts, uh, principal violist in the Urbana Pops Orchestra, won first place Illinois State Fair Fiddle Contest in 2012, and has placed twice in the Illinois Old Time Fiddlers Association State Contest, and just for some random information, is a certified Alexander Technique teacher. Hello, Robin. Hello, Daniel. We also have Tom Foe, who has music degrees from University of Maine and Tufts, and an ABD from University of Illinois in Ethnomusicology, an assistant professor at Illinois State University, and in fact plays banjo, guitar, harmonica, and the accordion. Uh, won second prize in the 2010 Illinois State Fair Banjo Contest, and is the music director at Campus Middle School for Girls in Urbana. Hello, Tom. Hey, Daniel. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, the, the first thing I want to talk about in, in our theme today, um, Appalachian music and how it's celebrated in a festival that means a lot to you guys. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is just the, the rich cultural importance of uh, Appalachian music and how it started and specifically how you guys were inspired by it and how you got into it. Um, so first of all, let's talk about a little bit about how it came you know, to America. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so this is part of the great American fiddling tradition. And uh, as you know, and probably many listeners know, uh, the f- uh, fiddle and fiddle dance music came across the Atlantic largely from the British Isles, uh, Ireland and Scotland, and mm-hmm. settled. Uh, these were, you know, these were poor people. These were indentured servants and so forth, or people fleeing uh, economic or social, bad social conditions in the British Isles, and they settled in often the poorest places uh, accessible in North America, meaning Appalachia, places where you uh, have a hard time growing corn. Um, and uh, so they, they gravitated toward the hollers, West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, uh, that whole mountainous strip, and the fiddle tradition that they brought with them flourished. The old dances, the old uh, AABB form dances that they brought with them flourished. Uh, their fiddle tradition, uh, the making of whiskey flourished. Of course. Um, and it was there in the Mid-South that uh, these poor people came in contact with another musically rich population that was Africans first and then African Americans uh, who brought the prototype of the banjo mm-hmm. with them. Um, and I tell you, if I could go back to any moment in history one moment in history. It would be that moment somewhere, probably on some anonymous plantation in the South, where some banjo player met some fiddle player. Mm. Uh, These two incredible streams of music came together with an explosion that we're still listening to. There Mm. is no style of American popular music that didn't come out of that moment. So how, I mean, when did you first hear it? Uh, I grew up in, uh, mostly in rural Maine, and uh, there's a strong fiddling tradition there. One of the places that uh, fiddle players went was Canada uh, and New England, and there's a strong fiddling tradition there. So I grew up sort of listening to it Mm -hmm. and going to fiddle contests, Uh, and as a guitar player, many of my friends played fiddle, and I uh, had the opportunity to accompany them at fiddle contests and Mm -hmm. play at dances and so forth. So it was sort of part of my growing up. Sure, and Robin, you, you started out as a strings player, yeah. Uh, as a young person. So were you interested in um, this style of music before you met Tom? Or were you more interested in something else and then when you met him? Well, when I was growing up, the fiddling that I heard was uh, the backgrounds of my dad's Hank Williams records. And uh, I grew up 
in Florida, very, very close to the home of George Jones and Tammy Wynette. And mm. that was the that was the landscape of a lot of the background music in mm. my younger years. Uh, when I started playing violin, uh, it was in, uh, actually, uh, just to get a plug-in for school music programs, I'm a product of the first year that they had strings in the public schools in my hometown. And, uh, Which was where? In Lakeland, Florida. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I'm always quite fond of the string teachers here in town because I think they're doing a good job. Mm. But, uh, you know, I went through the whole youth orchestra and was really just a classical musician. That was my training. I got my degree in viola performance and learned classical music. And, and you are a fabulous uh, violist, if I might say so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, uh, I started teaching, and I enjoy teaching a lot. And uh, I wound up with a really fun job in a tiny little town in Indiana and uh, I had to just I was the music teacher there and this guy kind of mid-20s guy came in said he wanted to take fiddle lessons and I thought to myself well okay I can help him with his technique and he said well I want to learn this tune that my grandpa did and uh, the way we navigated that was that he brought in a recording of his grandpa playing and I figured out how to play it mm -hmm. so I could teach him how to play it. And that was actually the first of my fiddling, but I didn't do anything with it for a while. And I moved here to Urbana in 92 and uh, ran into a really good fiddle player named Colin McCoy, who uh, sort of boasted that he could teach me everything I needed to know in two lessons. And actually wow. he did. It just took me a really long time to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still refer back to those lessons, but those must have been pretty expensive lessons oh, for you to yeah. learn the entire technique yeah. of fiddling. Yeah, I think I had to get him a six pack or something. Oh. I'm not sure, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, he was he was very generous with his information. Mm -hmm. But um, he he was also a, a many year state champion. For yeah, in Illinois. Yeah, he's he's quite a good fiddle player mm -hmm. and plays various styles, um, and then just along the Along the years, I have played various various things, and I tried a couple of times to get into old-time fiddling. And um, finally, shortly before, uh, I guess I had met Tom, but before we, shortly before we started actually playing music together, um, I fell in with a fiddle player who I could learn from, mm -hmm. um, named Billy Matthews. And um, he, Billy's just got such a solid bow technique and he has a really clean sense of his own sound. And so it was easy for me to kind of fall in with him. And I got that kind of a start. And then I started playing. Tom put together a band that uh, we wound up calling Oberon the Possum King. <laughs> and that's really where I learned how to be a, a fiddler, I think, is playing music with those guys. I can imagine that um, the technique that you polish to play classical music is, is a lot <laughs> different, and fiddling would be an extreme departure from some of the techniques that you use to perform classical music? Yeah, my goal became um, to be able to go into a jam session and not have everyone look at me and go, oh, you're classically trained. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it's like, you know, and then in the orchestra, it's it's a completely different thing. But, you know, it's the same, it's the same three variables, no matter how you use your bow. Mm -hmm. It's just you have to reorganize them and reprioritize how you, how you use the bow. I got you. So, what was what was the thing that you had to unlearn the most to to fit in? Um, as a classical player, you spend a lot of time being able to draw a full bow with constant unwavering tone, and you just never use that. In fact, I don't think you really use it that much in classical music <laughs> either. But we just that's how we learn to control a bow. But uh, so there's the the bowing, which is a lot uh, less focused than the most desirable classical mm -hmm. tone. And, um, and then there's uh, inflection of pitch, which... Um, Isn't as, as militantly regulated, I assume. <laughs> that's a really nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's, it's fun to... You can really... Um, you know, if you're... You can, you can do this in classical music if you're not sitting in a section. You know, mm -hmm. if you're interpreting your sonata, you can do it a bit. But to be able to really bend the pitch mostly down, hardly ever up. Mm -hmm. um, and to just 
really make kind of a good grinding noise. That the only other place uh, where I feel comfortable doing that is if I'm playing a, a baroque sonata, where I really want to bend the pitch. But there's a wide intonational field accepted there too. Sure. Yeah. So we we're talking about fiddle. You <laughs> mentioned the uh, the prototype of the banjo coming from African American slaves. Mm. What other instruments are are fairly common uh, to represent? Appalachian music? Uh, well, the guitar came in much later, of course, uh, mostly disseminated through mail order catalogs, late 19th, I mean, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. So by the 1920s, <clears throat> which we sort of consider kind of the golden age of uh, old time music because so many recordings were made, by that time the guitar was a real mainstay. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to the guitar, of course, the mandolin. Uh, which had its glory days in Italy in the 19th century, but uh, somehow found its way into the hands of uh, country musicians in the South, in the Mid-South. Um, I guess the string bass came in uh, probably by way of jazz music uh, and uh, other instruments, the slide guitar. Uh, America went through a, a Hawaiian music craze mm -hmm. in the 1920s, and um, many country musicians took up the slide guitar. Uh, and it's got that slinky sound, not unlike a fiddle played the way Robin is describing, mm -hmm. uh, that very flexible sense of uh, pitch and intonation. Uh, and <clears throat> I think there's something about sliding instruments, instruments with real, with that slinky uh, intonation played with sort of rigidly uh, fixed pitch instruments that, that creates a kind of tension that is, that's part of this tradition. It's probably a good compliment as The fiddle well. and the banjo uh, up in in Quebec, where I uh, used to live and studied uh, the fiddle and the accordion the same way. It's the same kind of relationship, uh, the fixed pitch and the sliding pitch mm -hmm. instrument. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about how um, this style of music is, has inspired um, later genres in music, country music, even jazz. Um, what, what specifically inspired you? What, what made you fall in love with playing that kind of music? I started uh, playing bluegrass when I was a teenager, and I think bluegrass was sort of a step, in a way, a step backwards in history, and I took later steps as I got older. Uh, bluegrass got me into, into uh, old-time music. <clears throat> I think I, I played in contradance bands uh, when I was younger in New England, but when I moved here uh, to do the PhD, my advisor, Tom Torino, is a fabulous banjo player. Uh, and he sort of, he reintroduced me to the banjo. I had played bluegrass style before, but he reintroduced me to this older style, this what's so-called old time style, uh, that, where we don't use finger picks and uh, it's a particular technique. Uh, part of his musical training was in Africa. Uh, and I, I think I heard a lot of African, Africanisms in his banjo playing and it totally inspired me. Uh, and he got me started on this, on the open back five string banjo that I play now. Um, and this is just one of those things. I've been a musician all my life, uh, but the banjo is the most natural thing I've ever played. As soon as it was in my hands, I knew just, mm -hmm. I knew what to do with it. Uh, and I think as far as falling in love with the music, it was right then and there when I started playing the banjo. Um, and as, uh, as we said before, the, the Banjo and fiddle is just a magic combination. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to be able to do what I do on the banjo and to have it complemented by the fiddle is just, you know, it is, it's truly magic. Uh, I find it that way. And, you know, as we'll talk about, when you go to Clifftop, you pull in there at night and there are 4,000 uh, people there mm -hmm. all playing fiddles and banjos together. It's, uh, it's very infectious. Sure. Um, so as, <laughs> as a child learning how to play banjo, obviously you're a fifth grader. You're in fifth grade band, you can go and learn how to play the flute or the clarinet from your, your school band director. How does one approach learning banjo as a kid? Yeah, so one of the things about banjo, and it's, uh, it's too bad we don't have uh, uh, video cameras as well as microphones here, uh, but I'll describe this to you as w when we start playing. When you're watching somebody play the banjo, uh, you can't really see what they're doing. Uh, so from where you're sitting, Daniel, you're looking directly at me, and all you can see is the back of my hand. Sure. Uh, and so the implication there is that somebody actually has to show you. It's one person teaching one other person. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to learn it. You can't watch a video. You can't watch somebody on stage do it. Uh, so the way a kid learns how to play is to have a good teacher. Mm -hmm. that, there's no, no substitute for that. Which I would assume draws a lot of parallels to how um, 
a lot of things, not just maybe musically are handed down in certain parts or maybe everywhere just by tell, like stories, for example, or tales, giving it to the next generation, maybe without such a rigid, um, I guess, ped like pedagogical approach. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, every every teacher has some pedagogical approach. Um, it's not necessarily formally academic. Yeah, uh, but when yeah. you learn when when you learn from a teacher, presumably you're learning from somebody who's thought about it and has some kind of methodology. Mm -hmm. um, but often, as you say, that methodology is passed down in families. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's not the case in my family, but um, it's certainly the case. It's certainly the, the case with my kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I play, and I've taught uh, my daughters how to play, uh, and so they're both good musicians. So they get it sort of in the mm -hmm. in the oral tradition that you're talking about. I got you. Um, so you you mentioned Clifftop um, just a few seconds ago, which is kind of the you know the whole reason that we're talking today, um, and I know that it means a lot to the both of you um, in, on a personal level. And um, if if the listeners don't know, there's there's a bit of a battle right now about how it's funded, um, where it's where it's getting its money. And you also talked just a few seconds ago about how you, you pull in and there there's music being played. Um, what what different kind of events can you expect to experience when you're there? Uh, okay, so we're talking about the um, Appalachian Old Time String Band Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, Clifftop, West Virginia. Uh, it happens every late July and early August. And uh, the, officially, I think it's a four-day festival. Yeah. Uh, but people roll in a week and a half before that, and really most of the action happens before that. What makes Clifftop unique is that, yes, there is a stage, and people do get up on the stage. Uh, there's a fiddle contest and a banjo contest and a band contest, but almost all of the action happens in the campground. Mm -hmm. um, this is not like a bluegrass festival where there's a parade of... Uh, musicians and professional bands who you know who roll in and perform uh, it's not it's not so much uh, presentational as participatory mm -hmm. um, which is pretty remarkable when you think of this uh, people rolling into this isolated onto this isolated mountainside uh, in West Virginia and just one after another opening up their cases and starting to play uh, if you get there two days into the you know into the camping uh, you roll in at night the way I did when I first went there. It's astounding. The woods are just throbbing, and uh, you know these are these are uh, you know vernacular fiddle players and banjo players, and they play in like two, three, maybe four keys. Uh, so the woods are throbbing in the key of D, mm -hmm. and uh, the the underlying rhythm of this thing is the good old American shuffle rhythm. Da 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 mm -hmm. da da. da. So you roll in, you roll down your window, or you get out of your car, and literally the the woods are just pulsing with this da 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 da, da. and it's it's like one group after another of three or four musicians, knee to knee, sitting around a cooler playing their brains out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's as close to a group musical trance as I think middle class American society ever gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about your first time at? At the festival, Robin. Yeah, our well, we we both went the first time together, oh, okay. and it, and it's, I would corroborate what what Tom says, mm -hmm. but it's it's all true. It's all true, it. and uh, so, and this is also true, is that the the schedule there, is that you play until you don't think you can stay awake sure. any longer, and which in our case is not as late as some other people, mm -hmm. <laughs> that the the. The younger people and even some of the older people literally start to put their instruments away around 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and for breakfast and then and then the people who went to bed earlier start around 8 so um, it, it's around the clock it is <laughs> really and um, the thing about it is like you're so you're you you totter into your tent at 2 a.m. and you've had a long beautiful glorious musically exhausting day mm -hmm. and you lie down and the first time we did it, there, you, it was kind of Charles Ivesy. Sure. <laughs> it's like you can hear, well, over there they're playing this tune, and over there they're doing that one, and over there they're doing that, and you can hear like four, five, six tunes mm -hmm. at the same time, and you you get to where you can sort of listen to that one for a while, and then change the direction of your hearing, and so you can hear them, and. Um, the first night I thought, I am never, ever going to sleep here because I can't go to sleep with all this music mm -hmm. around me. <laughs> you know, I was like, it was, you know, and it just, 
I guess the question is, would you want to fall asleep? Well, that's the other thing, you know. If it, but eventually you do. You fall yeah, asleep. You just and, drift and actually, off. And... It, yeah, it just becomes part of your environment, mm-hmm. part of your landscape. I think it's as close to being bees as human beings can get. Yeah. It is a hive thing. And it's, it is, you know, some people play faster and some people play slower, but the combined effect is all, you know, the ch- 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 mm-hmm. ch- and it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's really interesting to, to hear you talk about that because, it, I mean, it's very much like listening to folks talk about Woodstock mm-hmm. or some other thing that we, that we think about um, in relationship to a certain genre of po- like popular music, but it's like like the Woodstock of, of Appalachian music. The difference music. is that it's participatory. Mm-hmm. It's not a presentation the way Woodstock was. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were different ways to participate in Woodstock too, yeah. but, mm-hmm. uh, but this is everybody actually participating by holding an instrument and mm-hmm. playing together. Yeah. Now, and I've, when I link that to, uh, we were talking before you started the podcast uh, about just how old this phenomenon of music is. Mm-hmm. And, and we know that there's a, a flute that was discovered in a cave in Germany uh, that is probably about 43,000 years old. So human beings have been doing this for a long time. This is the beginning, back at the beginning of what it was to be a human being. Mm-hmm. We started playing music. Maybe language was there at the same time, maybe not. Maybe sports was there. Certainly farming was, was a long way away. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, this is twice as old as the caves at Lascaux. Uh, extremely old. And we've been doing it ever since. And I think what I feel when I go to Clifftop, when I roll in and hear that, hear that, uh, the woods throbbing with people doing this. I feel like I'm hooking into something extremely ancient, mm-hmm. uh, and not something I necessarily understand. Although I, I have a glimmer of understanding about this, um, but there, it tells me that there's something very deep in our humanity uh, that's being pushed forward in a little way by this festival. I, sure. I find things like this to be very important in just expressing ourselves as a member of, as members of a species. Mm-hmm. So does it feel like you did you discover? something new about yourself every time you go? Uh, I don't know if I can Or is can it just something it, that feels familiar? And you, I don't know if I can put it quite uh, as discovering something new about myself as much as discovering uh, an old connection, feeling, feeling extremely human. There's mm-hmm. something extremely, extremely brutally human about it. And familiar. It's, it's, yeah. And familiar, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure that, I, I think, I mean, Clifftop is certainly a, a modern or even a kind of postmodern event. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, back in the old days when people had first were playing banjos and fiddles together, they didn't have festivals. Uh, there weren't 2,000 people gathered together on a hillside. This is, this is kind of a phenomenon of late 20th, early 21st century America. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, it's, uh, I think we've tapped into something very deep here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, th- I find it very valuable. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually <coughs> interesting what you say about the, um, the length of time that we've... Um, we've been performing music and the fact that instruments predate a lot of things that we um, that we think of as general human constructs. Yeah. You said farming, um, language perhaps, and that even though it has predated that much that we don't put a higher priority on its preservation. And uh, one, one of the things that, um, that we're talking about today and in, in, in reading for this podcast is that um, something is something as simple as a budgetary issue on the state level is is threatening the entire existence of the program so um, yeah so the, the, oh, go ahead uh the state of west virginia uh the division of culture and history mm-hmm. obviously funds the program reading about it it appears that they've there have been some pretty extreme budget issues for a while um, west virginia has a new governor and it looks like this is one of the things on the chopping block this year um, their state legislator proposed a budget that would that would give appropriations to keep the program going, and the the budget that that was countered um, asked them to cut just a couple hundred thousand dollars out of a twenty four billion dollar budget for West Virginia. And I just think that that it's interesting that just a couple hundred thousand dollars would cause us to forget about something that that is connected to something we've been doing since before we were speaking. Um, I agree. It's a, I think it's a terrible thing. I think, I think there's something very powerful going on here. And I mean, I'm certainly no expert on West Virginia politics and ec- economics, uh, but having spent a little bit of time in the state, I do know uh, that that state is absolutely, absolutely dominated by one particular industry. Sure. Uh, it's an extremely poor state. People are in 
you know, in general, the level of health, the level, level of economic health is very low for ordinary people, mm -hmm. dominated by this coal industry. Uh, that uh, it seems, by all evidence, seems to be vanishing, and it, 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 it seems that these politicians are hanging on to everything they possibly can get uh, and cutting everything uh, down to the bone uh, otherwise. Yeah, it's and this is one of those things, I mean... Clifftop and the division of culture in the state of West Virginia, these are things that really empower people. Uh, they're, really, they're things that really make people uh, feel like they belong to each other and belong to the state. Uh, it's, it's a celebration of their history and a celebration of their culture and a celebration of people uh, cooperating. And uh, I just find it almost obscene to, to see uh, the, the coal industry and its, its, uh, you know, its representatives cutting this thing that that builds people up mm -hmm. just something that's kind of a part of our of our human requirement and yeah. it's you know we were having a podcast we had a podcast earlier um about music education and the challenges that the teachers face and about how we we get in, into this habit of defending paying for arts programming um both for things like um uh clip top and also school music and how we have this laundry list of reasons um, we have memorized you know it Im improves our ability to read and it improves our math skills and the fact that we don't just say exactly what you just said now is that we it's important and we should pay for it because it makes us better human beings on its own yeah not that it makes us better mathematicians sure. or accountants right. or, yeah. or marketers mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's it's definitely so. not a trend that um, that's new obviously um, with with our new administration we're hearing a lot about it as well uh, the National Endowment for the Arts and uh, actually this is this is important because you guys are both the co co-founders of uh, the C4A nonprofit organization Urbana Pops Orchestra is also a registered nonprofit um, a lot of what we do is dependent on this the federal funding from uh, from the, the National Endowment for the Arts. And it seems like, um, right as we are moving into uh, transition land with the, the Trump administration, that they are seemingly concentrated on, on cutting or completely defunding the National Endowment for the Arts. This is all connected to the, the financial issues that um, the uh, the Appalachian Festival is having, also things that could affect us on a on a personal <coughs> level as well. What what would you say to someone asking how it is we make a difference? Well, so uh, with regard to Clifftop and the Appalachian Music Festival, uh, there is a longtime participant, a woman named uh, Hillary Burrams, who uh, is assembling an argument uh, to be presented to the governor in West Virginia and the legislature there. Uh, an economic argument for preserving at least the festival, mm -hmm. uh, if not the the uh, division of the, the state division that operates the festival, but at least the festival, uh, making an argument that people come from all over the country and spend a lot of money there. They buy gas, mm -hmm. uh, they buy food at the you know, and they buy their tents at the Walmart, and they buy food at the grocery store, and they, it's actually a, a strong economic a asset. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that seems like, I mean, that's, that's something that, uh, you know, these guys have to listen to. Sure. Um, beyond that, I don't know. What do you do? Do you just, co you constantly, you can't get tired. You just have to harangue your legislators mm -hmm. and tell them how important it is to you. I, I have a thought that you mentioned thousands of people coming to the state from, from across the country. Um, do you think that empowers people maybe that don't live in West Virginia to write the local legislator as well? You mean to write West Virginia legislation? Yeah, like, you know, we, we're from Illinois. We, the, the folks in Illinois are from California or whoever that, go, that goes to this festival. It means a lot. Sure. We don't live in West Virginia. We don't elect those officials. But just because of its, of its impact on your life, you know, wouldn't that compel I you? I think so. I think that's what, what those politicians mm -hmm. listen to. Mm -hmm. Yes, we come to your state. Mm -hmm. We love your state. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do spend money, and we look forward to doing it again. Sure. Uh, so don't cut this thing. Yeah, and on a on a larger scale, like that's what we need to be doing here at home, mm -hmm. and it's what we need to be doing, you know, on a local, regional, state, national sure. level. Yeah, I, I think that if we have, um, if if we've made the time to write West Virginia about saving this festival, that very easily we are we are required to write home at, for, to folks at home, and absolutely, um, yeah. yeah. 
Urbana Pops has been really fortunate from arts funding in Urbana, the Urbana Arts Council. We get money from them. I, I think you, you guys must get money from them as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, for different programs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I haven't heard anything about diminishing the, the amount of money they plan to give. However, it still doesn't mean that we shouldn't write find out information where no uh, the folks that we well no, they want to know that we appreciate it if mm-hmm. if if they're not going to cut it let's thank them for that too mm-hmm. you know i think that thanking your elected officials for something that you approve of is gives them fuel to to keep pushing sure. for, for it and i think that a thank you is at least as powerful as a complaint sure maybe more so yeah because there's no reason and they know that people are less likely to thank them than they are to complain. Mm-hmm. So each one is weighted more. Now, I think um, I think that you have uh, a unique insight about this because you run a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. So not only are you participants of the festival, and you, you it's had an impact on your life, but also you run your own nonprofit organization. You understand how how hard money is to get. Mm-hmm. Um, so what part of you identifies with? That? I mean, what's you know, how hard is it for you? to get money how how stressful is it with our organization we're we're very fortunate because um the participation by the people who are involved in our in our programs is most of our financial support mm-hmm. i think um, we're, we're unusual in the world of uh, of community music schools mm-hmm. and then almost almost all of our funding mm-hmm. comes from our programming directly mm-hmm. uh, from tuition and our membership uh, although we do with the Illinois Arts Council has been generous, and mm-hmm. uh, Urbana Arts as well has been generous, mm-hmm. uh, and we have gotten uh, grant money from them, and yeah. it, it has helped for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we're a little bit unusual in that, that we get so much of it from programming. Sure. We're not we're yeah. not on the chopping block in that sense. People support us. Now, in, in instances <coughs> like the the Appalachian String Band Festival, um, do participants pay to to There's attend? There's an entry that? fee. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and actually, we you know, the festival. There's a fairly large staff that gets put to work Mm -hmm. for the at least for the weeks that we're leading up to and that they're there and I know the the people who work there are uh, they seem to be very happy that we're there Mm -hmm. you know I I think they are because it's it's a good it's a good working environment sure and um and it's and it's a job for at least a few weeks you know so so we've been talking a lot about funding uh attending the festival and Tom, you're sitting here holding your banjo, and we're sitting in this beautiful room full of instruments, and I assume that you guys must have in your repertoire some music that could be representative of what we're talking about today. We play a lot sure. of that. Yeah. 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 Sure. Um, and I was wondering, perhaps, maybe if you could play some for us now. Be happy We'd to. be delighted to. Mm-hmm. Thank you. 
right, so tell me a little bit about that particular tune. Yeah, it's a tune called Frosty Morning, or Cold Frosty Morning, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's one that I uh, certainly learned when I was coming up playing contra dances up in New England. Uh, but I think it's a it's an Appalachian fiddle tune, mm-hmm. and it probably has roots in the British Isles. There is probably some version, uh, some tune that is very similar to that, probably with a different name uh, that comes from Ireland. Mm-hmm. I I couldn't help but notice um, if you listen really carefully to to, uh, to the style of music that you can see direct parallels to um, some of the newer newer music in the 20th century that we are writing for orchestras as well. Uh, you can hear a little bit of Aaron Copland's. You can hear a little bit of Bernstein. Mm-hmm. Are those things that you listen for as well, or do you like when you when you listen, for example, to to fan, the the white intervals, lots of rhythm? Well, I think both of those composers were influenced by American vernacular music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I don't think of uh, I don't think of Copland when I'm playing the banjo. No. Oh, you don't? Okay. No. <laughs> I suppose I don't think about him too much either. But it's you know there there um, there are some unmistakable. Um, har- harmonic language, I yeah. think, uh, that they share. Um, fanfare for the common man. Like, you could draw a, a parallel even maybe from, fa- like, Fanfare for the Common Man, um, where the intervals are very wide, and, it's, sure. and it's a, it's, it causes a very compelling sense of, you know, uh, of direction with the music. Yeah. Well, you know that Kaplan was well aware about this uh, old fiddle tunes, too. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, the classic one, the... Mm-hmm. That one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. How did I not mention that? In the first, because that's that's a pretty obvious. Like you know. Yeah. It, I know that his um, uh, folk tunes influenced a lot of, of what he wrote. Um, yeah. uh, in Appalachian Spring, even. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, you know, a, a, an, an obvious name in itself, plus um, you know a, a really well-known old uh, folk tune at, uh, toward the end. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think traditional music is the well that these guys went to mm-hmm. that's that's what they drank from in order to yeah you know to inspire mm-hmm. themselves mm-hmm. uh so you guys have one more i think sure yeah yeah Thank you. 
what's captivating. <laughs> it's really, really great. Uh, Sally in the Garden. Yeah. Um, we were thinking about it here uh, toward the break, and something that I, I forgot to hit on a little bit earlier is there is uh, an apparent and very important improvisational component uh, to to playing these tunes. Um, how much of that is, I guess, how much of the tune is improvisation versus just the tune that you know? How much do you rely on improvisation to, to do the whole thing? Yes, uh, it is improvisational, not in the sense that jazz is, where you have an underlying chord progression mm -hmm. and you're constantly reinventing the melody. Uh, in this case, we have a, a sort of skeletal melody that we all recognize, whether mm -hmm. you're from you know, Maine or Texas or Illinois, everybody recognizes the basic melody of this thing. Uh, but the fun in them, um, and actually the survival in playing them, because you would go insane playing these tunes you know, 20 times over mm -hmm. if you didn't vary it, uh, is varying them around the edges. So cadences near the ends of phrases, mm -hmm. often uh, you'll do something different every time around. Mm -hmm. uh, and then increasingly, if you're really you know, kind of going into the zone with your fellow musicians, uh, you start taking liberties throughout the tune. Mm -hmm. um, Which you can tell when you guys start playing that you are almost immediately in the zone. And you can see it on your faces too. I don't know if you guys ever noticed that, but it's, yeah. it's almost immediate as soon as you start playing. Well, that's the wonderful thing about playing with somebody for years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of this tradition too. I mean, uh, you know, the tunes get handed down from one member of the family or one member of the community to another. Uh, and it's not just that you rehearse for a performance and then you move on to the next thing. Uh, these tunes are really part of your life, so sure. you just keep playing. And you know, I mean, we've been—I've been playing these tunes for more decades than I want to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but we've been playing this and tune. For Robin and I have been playing them together for so. a long time. Yeah. So you develop a vocabulary of improvisation. Sure. Yeah. Um, we we're also talking about this. The form of this particular tune was different than the one that we've played before. Yeah. Uh, so I would say, uh, at least the of the Appalachian tunes, and this this varies. Uh, varies by region too and I, I would say it's not true of Kentucky fiddle tunes uh, but in a lot of places in Appalachia the fiddle tunes uh, pretty much have a f have a 32 beat form mm -hmm. a repeating 32 beat form so it's an A section the A section repeats there's a B section that's exactly the same length and then that repeats mm -hmm. that's the form that we've inherited from the British Isles A A B B uh, and it ends up being 32 beats in some places and some fiddlers uh, really like to take liberties with that. Um, and there are some dances that will accommodate it. Mm -hmm. So that pr the tune that we just played has a, an extra two beats, I guess in both in the A section and the B section, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> gotcha. And some, in some regions, this fiddle music is like that. I mean, in, in rural Quebec, uh, fiddle players would be ashamed to play 32 beats. They, <laughs> you know, they, they insist on making them crooked, what they, they call air tordu. Yeah, uh, that is crooked tunes. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, so that 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 is also the English where they you know oh this one's crooked. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out, this one's crooked. Yes. I would I would think that crooked would be pretty popular though. Yeah. It is. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you take a, fun. Mm -hmm. you can take a tune and make it crooked oh, just sure. for your entertainment. I'm going to start doing that, I think, with a band of pops. I think you yeah, should. Yeah. yeah, I'll look forward to seeing what you come up we'll with make, there. We'll make Star Wars crooked. Yeah. I don't know how. <laughs> You'll have to teach me on how to make something crooked. Yeah, well, let's just put a slip a measure of five into Darth mm -hmm. Vader's theme. Well, in the little break there, uh, Chris Peterson, your producer, said something about the dances being aligned with the music. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if the expectation of the dancers is to play 32 beats, you play it crooked and you're likely to twist somebody's ankle. Sure. Um, but there are many dances, like, for example, up in Quebec or in Kentucky, uh, where it doesn't matter, where the dance is based on the beat rather than the section. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's also something I meant to ask earlier. Um, obviously, there's tons of Appalachian music um, at Clifftop when you guys go to that festival, but there must be other art forms represented as well. Um, I mean, are there a lot of folks dancing? Uh, or other like, there like is, maybe visual media. Yeah, there is yeah. traditional dancing, there's clog dancing, mm -hmm. and there are contra dances and square dances that are very popular mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go on until the wee hours. The um, teenagers gather at the top of the hill. Yeah, my daughters <laughs> love to be out there at 3 o'clock in the morning doing the dances. Mm -hmm. sure. um, and there are other folk arts that, mm -hmm. are, uh, that are taught there, uh, basket making and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. There's a, um, also some people who like everyone who goes there plays old time music, but there are a couple of pockets where musicians play other stuff sometimes. Like there was the, the tent that we discovered last year that was the 
Um, yeah, the older guy who brings a, his pedal steel. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a guy who spent years on the road with Loretta Lynn, uh, and he sh he shows up with a battery-operated pedal steel guitar, mm -hmm. and so all the swing players and country players pile into his tent. Yeah, the swing tent, and then there's the Cajun tent. <laughs> yeah, there's the, the infamous Cajun tent. Uh, but one nice thing about Clifftop, um, and uh, you shouldn't get the impression that it's really outsiders, people, you know, cosmopolitan people piling in from mm -hmm. all over the country to spend their week in uh, West Virginia. It's very West Virginia centric. Mm -hmm. um, and so the producers, uh, the announcers on the stage, and many of the contestants, many of the fiddlers, and many local people, there are a lot of West Virginia fiddlers. Mm -hmm. There is a very strong tradition mm -hmm. of playing that is still extremely alive, extremely vibrant. Uh, people just grow up learning how to play mm -hmm. the fiddle from their uncle. Yeah, you uh, see children. It's that's a, a really nice part of this festival. I mean, there are, there's some speculation that well, if it doesn't happen in West Virginia, maybe there's so much excitement around this thing that you know we could have it in a national park someplace or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it would be missing something crucial, and that is the connection to the local community. Sure, uh, it's a very very strong part of the festival. Mm -hmm. Which which also reminds us of the issue that um, this is a thing that might not be a thing. Uh, in the future. So if you're listening, uh, if you care about the, the preservation of, of the music that we love and the, the music that makes us good people, write a letter to your representative, your senators, and thank them for, for funding it in the first place and, and demand that they keep funding it. Yeah. yeah. I want to thank you guys so much today. Thank you for coming. You taught me a lot about Appalachian music. It was really great just to hear you guys speak so passionately about it. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for doing thanks it. Thanks for it was having us. It's a pleasure. Check out our website, urbanapops.org, where you can always find the most recent episode of the UPO Popscast, as well as information about the orchestra and upcoming performances and events. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash urbanapops, where there are pictures and behind-the-scenes footage of this episode. We'd like to give a special thanks to the Community Center for the Arts for providing a studio space you can read more at c4a.org. The EPO Pops cast is produced and engineered by Chris Peterson. And my name is Daniel Sutherland. And from all of us here at Urbana Pops Orchestra, thank you for listening. Make sure to hit the subscribe button, and we will see you next time.